I would like to introduce Dr. Grace Lindsay, who is a computational neuroscientist, currently an assistant professor of psychology and data science at New York University in the U.S. Professor Lindsay conducted her PhD research at Columbia University, and during this time she also received a Google PhD fellowship in computational neuroscience. In her research, Professor Lindsay combines neuroscience, psychology, and machine learning. Her work aims to use artificial neural networks to understand the brain, with a specific focus on modeling the attention and perception processes. On the applied research side, Professor Lindsay is focused on using machine learning for climate change mitigation. In addition to all her academic research, Professor Lindsay has been a science communicator. Her popular science book, in short called Models of the Mind, is a fantastic read which we recommend to everyone. In it, Professor Lindsay explains in very accessible language how mathematics has helped us to understand the brain and behavior. Okay, yeah, so I am going to kind of um, overview a bit about how artificial neural networks um, interface with neuroscience and how they can be used mod as models of the brain. And then uh, towards the end, I'll get into this rather separate line of work that I'm also doing in my lab about um, using them for climate change applications. Okay, so the current state of artificial intelligence, um, I would say, is that we have these really impressive artificial neural networks that can be trained to perform many different kinds of tasks and produce different behaviors. So they can be trained to do visual recognition, produce language, understand language, play games, both kind of simple video games, but also more challenging um, uh, uh, video games like um, uh, Starcraft and uh, board games that humans have like struggled with and studied for centuries like Go. Um, so they are these, in some sense, simple models, you know, of individual artificial neural units connected via different connection weights. Um, and they can do these really impressive things. They can produce these behaviors that are the sign of intelligence in some sense. Um, and so that can be seen. I mean, I'm sure people have been hearing a lot about of all of these chatbot interfaces that are coming out that can produce language that can be indistinguishable from human produced language. Um, so there's those kinds of like flashy uh, use cases of it, things like stable diffusion that can generate full images that look like they are photographs or images uh, made by humans. And then also just a lot of this is happening behind the scenes when you interact with social media sites and all of that, there's machine learning and artificial intelligence that's going into the algorithms that decide what you see on those. So it's really, um, um, the artificial neural networks are performing all of these amazing feats, um, producing all of these behaviors that, you know, when you look at them could look like it must be a human behind them. Uh, at the same time, neuroscience is trying to figure out how humans produce those behaviors. So how humans produce language, how humans take in um, visual images or other sensory stimuli and, um, you know, conclude uh, useful things about the world from those things. Uh, neuroscience is trying to figure out how uh, the set of biological neurons that are interconnected in the brain, how those things produce um, behaviors. And in many ways, there can be overlap in the type of behaviors that um, neural networks and the brains produce. And in fact, the, the idea of calling it artificial intelligence says that it's an artificial version of the natural thing, of, of natural intelligence. And usually people are talking about human intelligence and that. So um, clearly the kind of behavioral output that both of these fields are interested in has a lot of overlap. And one of them builds artificial neural networks to do that. The other studies natural neural networks um, to see how that's done in the brain. So it's a very natural question of can these two endeavors help each other progress? Can they help each other understand the, you know, can artificial neural networks help us understand the brain? Can we take inspiration from the brain to um, make artificial neural networks better? Um, and so I'm going to focus today on vision as a kind of case study, because uh, one, that's where a lot of research in neuroscience is done. There's a lot of research that's done in the visual system, and that's partly to do with kind of historically, it um, there were advances that I'm going to talk about um, back in the 50s and 60s that kind of laid the groundwork for a lot of people to become interested in studying vision. Um, at the same time, Primates dedicate a lot of their brain to vision, so it's naturally very relevant, especially if you're interested in the human brain, to think about the visual system as kind of one of the dominant inputs to the brain. Um, and then also at this intersection of neuroscience and AI, um, there's been a lot of crosstalk in vision. Um, and um, 
one of the kind of biggest um, papers that set off this deep learning revolution that's led to all of these really impressive artificial neural networks was a paper that solved a, a visual challenge, the ImageNet um, object classification challenge. So vision has been this really important um, topic area in both neuroscience and artificial intelligence and at the intersection of neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Uh, so just a quick overview of um, how the visual system works in primates. So um, I think you probably can guess that visual information comes in first through the eye. Um, it activates photoreceptors that are in the back of the eye and the retina. And um, that then that uh, information that comes from those photoreceptors being uh, activated gets sent along nerve pathways through the optic nerve to um, a subcortical region called the lateral geniculate nucleus, but then onto the cortex. So the cortex is the part of the brain that's kind of wrinkly and that we mostly see when we look at a brain, but there's a bunch of other stuff that happens beneath the cortex called the subcortex. Um, but we are going to focus mostly on the cortex uh, to understand um, visual processing here. And so the main um, point where information comes into the cortex is through the primary visual cortex, which is in the back of the brain. Um, and then that goes on to different pathways. Sometimes they're called the where and the what pathway. So you can think about um, them as pathways that kind of help the brain figure out what it's looking at, what's in an object, um, and also pathways that are more focused on um, tracking movement in, uh, in incoming visual input. Um, and so those kind of, so the, the information comes into the primary visual cortex and then kind of goes along different pathways to different regions of the brain to go on to, you know, influence um, what we perceive and how we act and all of that. So that's the basic setup of the visual system. Um, the historical finding that I was referencing um, came from these two scientists, Hubel and Weasel, and they were studying vision in cats. Um, cats have a similar enough visual system to primates and humans um, that a lot of the findings ended up being generalizable. Um, but the setup that Hubel and Weasel used was that they um, put an electrode into the primary visual cortex of cats, so that area in the back of their brain that gets the first um, inputs from uh, the eye. Uh, so they put an electrode in there and the electrode can pick up the electrical activity that neurons emit when they're transmitting information. So they have an electrode that picks up what uh, the, the neurons are doing there. And then they're just showing the cat different visual stimuli. Um, there had been previous work that suggested that um, neurons in this subcortical area responded to little circles of light. So if you had like a dark dot uh, in a white background, you might get neurons uh, in, in this uh, lateral geniculate nucleus to uh, respond, to emit spikes. And then they were trying to figure out, well, what do the neurons in primary visual cortex respond to? Um, and it actually was the case that their discovery was a bit of an accident. So they were showing um, little dots to the, the cat because they knew that that's what caused the, the neurons in the subcortical area to get excited and to produce a response. Um, and then they were doing that by using like an old school slide uh, presenter. And when they were switching out slides to show different types of dots, um, it caused a bar of light to go across the screen and they heard the um, neuron respond to it. Uh, so they accidentally discovered that the neurons in primary visual cortex tend to respond to bars of light instead of dots of light, basically. So lines instead of points. Um, and so uh, they then followed up on that kind of accidental discovery by showing the cat a bunch of specific oriented lines in different locations with different properties to really characterize what the neurons in this brain area respond most to. And what they found, they classified into two broad um, categories of neurons. So they found things called simple cells, which are neurons in the primary visual cortex whose response um, depended on specific details of the bar of light that was shown to the cat. Um, and so uh, this plot here is showing the response of a neuron. So each vertical bar is when a neuron spikes, so when it emits a signal, um, and is therefore, you know, kind of conveying information about the stimulus on the screen. And so what you can see here is that when this bar of light is on and it's in this specific orientation, uh, this neuron emits a lot of spikes. So it's responding strongly to it. Uh, if the bar is in this orientation, so um, kind of orthogonal almost uh, to what it was, it doesn't emit spikes. And if there's no bar at all, the neuron doesn't emit spikes. 
Um, also, if there is a bar in the correct orientation, but in a slightly different spatial location, the neuron doesn't emit spikes when the bar is on, but once the bar turns off, it, emit, it emits a few spikes. So this was suggesting a very specific pattern that needed to be present on the screen to get this neuron to respond, and that's to have this bar of light uh, at this uh, exact spatial location, and that would make the neuron respond very robustly. And they called these simple cells because they responded to these simple bars at simple at single locations. And so this neuron has this orientation preference, but you can imagine other neurons having uh, different orientation preferences where they would only respond to a bar in their preferred orientation at their exact um, preferred spatial location. So those are the simple cells. The complex cells had a similar property in the sense that they cared about the exact orientation of the bar. So the bar of light had to be facing this way. And if you put a bar of light the other way, the neuron wouldn't respond. But these complex cells don't care as much about the specific spatial location. So you can see you can put this bar in a few different places um, next to each other or move it up and down a little bit, and you still get a robust response from the neuron. So these complex cells have preferred orientations that the bar of light needs to be in, but they have more broader spatial selectivity. They allow for that bar to be in more spatial locations. They're kind of invariant to the spatial locations of the bar. And um, through these uh, the, these recordings of these neurons and primary visual cortex, Hubel and Liesel put together a kind of model of how they thought um, these kinds of response properties from the neurons were arising. So to get a, a simple cell, to get a cell that responds to a bar of light in a particular orientation, uh, they just thought that they had to take input from the cortical cells that I said respond to little dots of light. And if you put those dots of light in a row, you get a bar. So if this simple cell got input from the cells in the subcortical region and the input was aligned in just the right way so that it gets input from three neurons that represent three dots in a row, um, then that uh, neuron in primary visual cortex could have this selectivity profile that we see where it, per, where it will only respond if light shows up in that exact orientation. Um, and a different neuron that has a different orientation preference would get input from cells um, that form a row in a different uh, orientation. And then how did the complex cells come about? Well, if the complex cells get input from different simple cells that all have the same preferred orientation, but they all like different spatial locations, then you can get the response properties of the complex cell. So the complex cell can respond to a bar in different locations if it gets input from three different simple cells that represent those different locations. Then you can get the complex cell response uh, property. So that was their kind of contribution to document these response properties, to understand what um, neurons in the primary visual cortex respond to and how they could end up having those kinds of responses based on the anatomy of the visual system. Uh, and uh, a bit later, after Hubo and Liesel discovered that, there was an engineer um, in Japan uh, who heard about Hubo and Liesel's um, findings uh, and wanted to build kind of a computational model of them that he was hoping could do artificial vision. So uh, by following, you know, the neuroscience literature about how the visual system works, it's natural to think you can take that information and try to replicate it in computer code and um, be able to create a functioning visual system. And so um, that's what Fukushima did um, starting in the 70s. And so he made this model uh, that can take in very simple images, kind of binary images of simple shapes. Um, and then it has a layer that's meant to represent what that subcortical region, the LGN, does in terms of uh, responding to small dots of uh, contrast. And then it, uh, he has these layers that he labels as the simple cell layer, complex cell layer, simple cell layer, complex cell layer. Um, so this is directly coming from um, what Hubel and Weasel described. And actually, uh, so he read the Hubel and Weasel paper, which really only talks about simple and complex cells in primary visual cortex. It doesn't talk about kind of what happens after that, the other pathways in the visual system, you know, what would come after the complex cells have done the processing that they did or what they project to. It really stopped at the complex cells. 
Um, and he, uh, in an interview later, he said he was kind of waiting for Hubel and Weasel to tell him what comes after that so that he could finish building his model. Um, but they didn't end up following up uh, in, on that line of work. They instead went to study the development of the visual system. Uh, so then he just had to assume that the same kind of patterns repeat. And that's how he ended up building this model, uh, which is called the, uh, the neocognitron. And when you replicate that pattern of simple and complex cells over and over, you can get a final layer of this, what is essentially an artificial neural network, you can get a layer that's kind of invariant to certain perturbations in the input. So if you had the same um, the same uh, shape in different locations or things like that, you could end up getting a classifier that could still recognize those as all the same shape, even though on the pixel level in the input image, they'd be very different. Um, and so this really formed the basis of um, what is now the modern convolutional neural network. And there's a direct line of influence, you know, from Hubel and Weasel to this neocognitron and from this neocognitron to these modern artificial neural networks that we use for computer vision. And to kind of make this um, very explicit, we can see here the relationship between these simple and complex cells and the two computations that form the basis of convolutional neural networks. And that would be the convolutional layer and the pooling layer. So as I said, these simple cells have preferred orientations that they respond to, and they have these preferred spatial locations that the orientation needs to be in. The complex cells get input from multiple simple cells with the same preferred orientation, and that's how they have this um, spatial invariance. Um, in the artificial neural network, you have a convolution that's applied to an image, and basically the convolution through the filter that it has uh, looks for a specific pattern at different locations in the image. So you can imagine that it looks for lines of a specific orientation um, based on the filter that the, is associated with the convolution. So that means that the artificial neurons in the convolutional layer of an artificial neural network have a preferred feature that they're looking for, and they have a specific spatial location that they respond to and different um, units in this layer will have different uh, spatial locations. The pooling layer then gets input from a bunch of these convolutional layer units, um, which all have the same preferred feature that they're looking for in the image, but they have different spatial locations that they respond to. And so now this pooling layer unit um, has a larger spatial receptive field. It has uh, it will respond to the same feature in different spatial locations, the same way that the complex cells do. So that's the direct connection between these simple cells and the convolution and the complex cells and pooling layers in convolutional neural networks. And these convolutional neural networks form the basis of a lot of modern um, computer vision uh, uh, applications. And so um, you can see here a structure that's very similar to the neocognitron. You put in an image, you have a convolution layer, a pooling layer, a convolution layer, a pooling layer. You can repeat that many, many times. Um, and then eventually it kind of goes into some sort of classification layer where you can train this network to classify images, um, you know, classify objects that are in images by doing supervised learning that updates all of the, the convolutional filters and all the weights in this network. So you can get these models that by putting in, you know, an input, the, the classic um, data set is the ImageNet data set that has um, over a million images images and they are each labeled according to one of a thousand different object categories, you can create a convolutional neural network that can be trained to label um, objects in those images by simply setting up this architecture and training it end to end. So um, when you have this architecture, this kind of um, hierarchy of um, convolution and pooling layers, uh, you do replicate a lot of the major trends that are observed in biological vision. Um, so kind of uh, Fukushima's guess that you can just do the same operations over and over and that will get you to a functioning visual system that was basically correct or correct enough. Um, so uh, some of the um, properties of the uh, the visual system that are present in convolutional neural networks as well is that as you go through the visual areas, you get larger and larger spatial receptive fields. So because of um, this, these pooling layers, um, meaning that each unit gets input from more um, units in the layer below and responds to a larger area in um, the input space, um, you get these larger areas of visual space that neurons respond to. And you see that as you go along the visual hierarchy in, in the primate brain. So these are just different brain areas and their receptive field size of the neurons in those brain areas. 
And then also you get an increase in the complexity of the features that the neurons respond to. And so that's by having these stacked convolutions. The first layer, you're, the convolution is looking for a pattern in the image, but at the second convolutional layer, it's looking for a pattern in the patterns in the image. And so you get this hierarchy of pattern complexity, where, as I said, in primary visual cortex, the neurons are responding to lines and edges and certain orientations. But as you go through the um, brain areas, they start to respond to more complex shapes and objects and faces and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, the the basic architecture of the uh, the convolutional neural network matches um, the basic architectural features of the visual system. And on top of that, and this is something that um, really had a big impact in computational neuroscience when um, these findings first started coming out. Um, in addition to just kind of having the basic setup that makes it similar to the visual system, if you train one of these um, convolutional neural networks to do uh, object recognition, to do something like the ImageNet uh, classification challenge, you get a network that you can then pass an image to in, into the network, and you'll get um, the response of the artificial neurons along the way. And uh, those responses uh, you can compare to what uh, the a real brain kind of responds if shown the same image. So you take an image, you show it to the artificial neural network that was trained to do object classification, and you show it to a subject where you're recording their neural activity. And you can ask what is the relationship between the artificial neural activity in response to this image and the real neural activity in response to this image. And one way to probe that relationship is to try to predict the real neural activity based on the artificial neural activity. And then you can ask how much of the real neural activity, the variance in the real neural activity, can you capture if you're using the artificial neural activity to predict it. And um, what's been found in, in this study that I'm showing here and in many studies since is that um, you can predict real neural activity better than any previous model that um, neuroscientists studying the visual system have proposed. So these black models here are previous models that people in computational neuroscience studying vision have worked with as models of the visual system. Um, and they do not predict the real neural activity in response to an image as well as if you use one of the layers in this convolutional neural network. So for example, in here, if we're trying to predict monkey, uh, an area of the, the monkey visual system called V4, you wanna use the second to last layer of this convolutional neural network. And then if you want to predict monkey area IT, which comes after V4 in this hierarchy, you use the last layer. So there's also this layer-wise correspondence where the last layer in the network corresponds to a later area in the visual hierarchy in the brain. The second to last layer in the network corresponds to the area that comes before that area. Um, so you get this relationship where it's really kind of recapitulating the visual hierarchy. And so that finding, the idea that, okay, we have these um, networks that are like a stand-in for the visual system, that opens up a lot of possibilities for using these networks to study visual processing, to study biological visual processing by playing around with these networks and probing them and training them in different ways to try to make them match the data even more. Um, you can really, you know, use this as a way to get insights into biological vision. And that's what my research does and what a lot of other people's research is, is focused on now. So I want to talk briefly about um, a study that I did, which is about using these networks to study attention uh, in uh, in the the primate uh, um, brain, and so um, you know, I think we all have a sense of kind of how attention is helpful in um, processing visual stimuli. So, for example, in this study, um, subjects are told a word, um, either a word that will actually be relevant to the task that they have to do later, or a, 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 a distractor word, or they'll just hear a white noise stimulus, so kind of a, a uh, meaningless stimulus. So they're they're told that. So in this case, they can hear the word pumpkin, there'd be a delay, and then they'd be shown this visual stimulus, which is actually a drawing of a pumpkin, but with this um, distracting uh, other uh, lines on top of it. And then they'd be asked, did you see a pumpkin, basically? And so on the trials where they're correctly cued, they're told the word pumpkin and then asked about a pumpkin, they have higher hit rates and detection sensitivity. So they're better at the task if they were correctly cued about what they're going to be asked about. Um, if they're incorrectly cued, so for example, they were told the word, word kangaroo, but then they were going to be asked if they saw a pumpkin, um, then their performance is worse. And if they're given the meaningless um, noise stimulus, their performance is uh, somewhere in between. 
Um, so uh, this shows that validly cueing attention to the correct object category increases people's visual detection performance. Um, and that's an interesting thing because nothing about the, um, the visual stimulus coming into the brain is different. It's purely some internal mechanism that's kind of changing how the visual system works um, based on the cue uh, that's creating this difference in performance. And these neural networks are a great way to to kind of understand that relationship. So to do that, um, what I first did was want to understand how does neural activity change in the brain during this? And there's a lot of studies where people um, have either humans or animals perform these kinds of tasks and record neural activity. And so one of the major findings there is that basically um, when you cue someone to attend to something like pumpkin or something like that, the neurons that normally respond strongly to that visual stimulus, their responses will be increased. So like we saw, the primary visual cortex neurons have their preferred orientation that they normally respond strongly to. If you had them, if you told the subject to attend to that orientation, uh, those neurons would respond even more strongly. And so this is just shown here. If you had um, in black, the, the response of the neuron normally to stimuli of different orientations, lines of different orientations, if you told them to attend to their preferred orientation, the firing rate of that neuron would go up. If you tell them to attend to an orientation that that neuron doesn't like, their firing rate actually goes down. So this is just a description of what's been found in neuroscience about how neural activity is modulated by attention. And it's just that the neurons that prefer the thing that's attended, they they start responding even more strongly. That's the main finding. Um, and so we can replicate that process in convolutional neural networks. And the first thing you have to do is just figure out how do these neurons normally respond to things. Um, and so to do that, you just show the network a bunch of images, in this case of different objects. So you could have, you know, pumpkin, kangaroo, clock, whatever it is. Um, and you can find out, okay, this neuron, for example, responds very strongly to this particular object category, let's say it's pumpkin. And so then when I want to tell the network to attend to pumpkin, I would just scale that neuron's activity up. So it normally has this kind of input-output function, and you can just change the slope of that input-output function to make that neuron respond even more strongly um, in, in conditions where it's supposed to be attending to its preferred object category. So if you just do that across all the neurons at a layer in the neural network, um, then you can replicate the, the findings from neuroscience in this model. Okay. So um, the results of that, so to replicate again, the kind of um, lab setup, um, we have the network perform a, a detection task. So it's shown kind of a challenging image um, here where there's kind of a clock on top of a greenhouse image. And then it's asked, is there a clock in this image? Just like in the experimental setup in the lab, people were shown these kind of difficult stimuli and asked, you know, was there a pumpkin in this or was there a kangaroo in this, that kind of thing. So it's just replicating that lab study. Um, and then you can do these attention modulations at different layers in the neural network. So this is the convolutional neural network um, that we're working with. And you can apply these attentional modulations at different layers. So this is just asking, can you take this idea from neuroscience about how neurons are changed by attention, put it into an artificial neural network, and get the same performance benefits that you get from attention in the brain? Uh, and the answer was yes. Um, particularly if you apply attention at the later layers in the network, you get a stronger increase in performance in this detection task. But you still get some increase um, from the early layers as well. So this was just a nice way of showing that you can connect neural changes to behavioral changes. You can connect the neural effects of attention to the performance effects of attention um, by using these models that have neural populations and also perform visual tasks. And that's really a benefit of these models above and beyond previous models in computational neuroscience, which couldn't do the visual task really. You know, we didn't have the computer vision at the, the level, at the quality um, where they could actually perform difficult visual tasks. And so it was hard to study how the brain performs those. Um, so in general, the kind of framework that I work in is that you can take ideas from brain structure and activity, put them into artificial neural networks, and then study this connection between um, uh, neural activity and behavior. Um, and that's a really powerful framework for neuroscience. And it's not just applied in vision, it's applied in all different things that people study about the brain, motor control, um, audition, olfaction, memory, all kinds of things. You can do this basic setup where you're using the fact that we now have artificial neural networks that are super powerful and can do challenging tasks. You can um, 
use that to, to probe this uh, neuro, uh, neuron behavior relationship that is at the core of what neuroscience wants to understand. Um, and then I wanted to include this, um, this kind of cautionary quote, which says that in our present state of ignorance, artificial neural networks are actually already in the position of suggesting physiological and psychological experiments. It would be unfortunate if, if psychologists did not play any part in this theoretical development of their own science. So this is kind of suggesting that artificial intelligence is developing at such a pace that it's kind of solving psychology or solving neuroscience without psychologists and neuroscientists even being involved. Um, but this quote uh, was actually from 1963, um, and it was talking about this specific um, finding about, uh, or referencing a specific finding about um, a very simple computer vision algorithm that helped inform um, uh, an understanding of how the frog visual system worked. Um, but I think that that's it's it's interesting to to think about this idea from the perspective of you know yes these artificial neural networks are becoming so impressive and performing these human like feats are they um you know kind of doing them in a human like way are there answers for how the brain works in these modern um these modern artificial systems um it's possible and it's something that has to be explored to kind of compare these systems to the brain um but at the same time there have been many points in history where we thought that you know, artificial intelligence was becoming incredibly impressive and was obviously, you know, must be working the same way that the brain does or um, would solve everything about neuroscience and psychology. And, and that hasn't panned out. Um, so it is something to consider, you know, um, how much can the, the engineering feats of artificial intelligence inform neuroscience? Um, but also we have to be careful because there's been hype and, you um, then kind of crashes around artificial intelligence many times in the past. Okay, so that's the um, psychology and neuroscience side of my work. If you uh, look at my lab website, I describe my lab as being about artificial neural networks for psychology, neuroscience, and climate change. And so there are these two separate goals. One, you know, to advance the study of the brain using artificial neural networks, and two, to advance the fight against climate change. And there isn't, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend that there's a very neat connection between these or that they really feed into each other. The truth is that climate change is an incredibly important and pressing problem, and I didn't feel comfortable continuing to simply study the brain um, when that problem exists. And so I needed to dedicate some amount of my time and energy to fighting climate change. And um, I took the ability to do that from the fact that I have a joint position in psychology and data science at uh, New York University. And so um, I, I'm allowed to, in the formal capacity, um, work on things like climate change. I'm even teaching a course on machine learning for climate change now. Um, so uh, it was just something that um, if I didn't have this opportunity to do both, I would have chosen climate change um, because, I, as I said, I, I, I couldn't continue simply studying the brain um, once I kind of understood the, the full um difficulties and importance of climate change. So that's the motivation. Um, there is a connection in the sense that I am using convolutional neural networks on the climate change side. Um, and so, as I said, you know, these are networks that are used in computer vision applications all the time in real world settings. Um, I have knowledge of, you know, training them and working with them from my interest in understanding biological vision, but they still apply perfectly well to these art uh, um, artificial computer vision applications. And in climate change in particular, there's actually a huge opportunity for computer vision solutions that comes specifically from uh, remote sensing data. Uh, so remote sensing is technically the study of, you know, objects without touching them. And so that can mean sensors that are actually still on the ground or pretty close to the object. Um, but for the most part, it usually refers to satellite and aerial imagery. So um, throughout, you know, the past several decades, there have been these um, these satellite missions that are mostly put up by governments, but also private companies that are simply um, imaging the earth constantly. Um, so they're just circling the earth, constantly taking pictures of the earth. Um, they have different sampling rates. Um, some of them take a picture of the same location on the earth every 16 days. Um, that's, you know, a, a function of the, the kind of orbit that they go into. Um, there's other systems that use multiple satellites to get sampling rates even higher than that. Um, so, and then there's, there are multiple of these systems operated by, by different governments and companies. So there's just a lot of data. <laughs> There's a lot of images of Earth um, that are available, and many of these um, data sets, especially from the, the government-run satellites, are publicly available. Um, so it's a huge 
opportunity to use uh, computer vision to be able to um, kind of make things more efficient, answer more questions, um, study things that are super relevant for climate change. And on top of the fact that they're just a lot of satellites and they're sampling the earth at a, a pretty high rate, um, it's also the case that these satellites don't just take normal um, pictures. They don't just take pictures that, you know, you normally if you're working with image data, you have like the three channels of red, green, blue. Um, that's not how these work. They usually take some form of hyperspectral image. Um, and that means that they're sampling along uh, more than just the visible spectrum on the ele electromagnetic spectrum. So they're sampling infrared and ultraviolet and um, just getting a higher uh, dimensional representation of what's happening on the ground. And that's really important and helpful because different uh, materials on the earth have different signatures in this um, higher dimensional uh, space on the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can use uh, these hyperspectral images which have uh, sampling along more wavelengths to detect what's happening on the ground. Uh, you can detect vegetation and soil properties and uh, man-made materials and all these things by the signature that they leave um, by sampling a wider range of wavelengths. Um, so that um, means that these um, images can be applied in ways that just regular kind of visual imagery couldn't. And it also, again, means that there's a lot of data <laughs> because you can have many, many spectral bands um, instead of just the normal three channels. Um, so there's a lot to be done with this data to try to get the most out of it as possible. And some applications, um, again, you're getting images from all over the world all the time. So you can imagine that there are many possible applications, um, climate change related ones. Uh, a lot of them center around monitoring agriculture. Um, so agriculture is actually a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions due to the way that people manage soil and also um, due to um, animal byproducts like gas and manure and things. Um, so understanding trends in agriculture, understanding um, the way in which land use is changing in order to make room for more agriculture as we need to feed more people is important and you can definitely measure that. Um, also agriculture is heavily impacted by climate change. So you you can use remote sensing to try to track um, crop yields or crop types and understand how um, food distribution is changing in different regions. Um, you can also use remote sensing to track urban activities and, and human activities. So transportation, again, is a huge source of emissions. And you can use this to try to estimate emissions that come from transportation or study transportation routes. Um, you can use it, again, to understand land use changes in urban settings um, and just generally track kind of human activity. Um, and then also there's kind of the um, tracking of natural resources and understanding how those are changing with climate change. Again, forests are, um, you know, great carbon sinks. They can store carbon. But if people come in and uh, do deforestation, uh, that's something you can measure. You can measure, you know, we have estimates of land use change that come from the formal allowed land use changes, but people are also um, deforesting areas illegally. And that's something you can see if you can just take a picture from above the forest and compare it over time, you'll notice those kinds of activities and you can try to stop them. Um, you can also monitor, you know, reforestation if there are explicit attempts to kind of build forest back. So you can um, track those um, from satellite imagery. So there's a lot of use cases um, for both tracking emissions, for trying to reduce emissions, for trying to understand the impacts of climate change. Uh, the particular um, setting that I'm doing this under is through a nonprofit called Collaborative Earth, and their goal is to bring a lot of different people together with a lot of different expertise and have them um, kind of volunteer to work on projects that will help with ecological restoration uh, kind of at scale. And so that's why they're interested particularly in machine learning so that you can automate this process of trying to understand changes and cause changes. Um, and so they are, they have a few different labs that study different things, um, studying kind of the health of rivers and um, the impact of bison, um, forest uh, reforestation projects, all that kind of stuff. And so there's a common thread where a lot of these different labs do rely on this kind of remote sensing data to track the variables of interest for their project. And the specific project that I'm a part of is the Beaver Lab. I'm the lab lead there. 
And our goal is to detect beaver dams and aerial imagery um, using convolutional neural networks. So you get an image like this. And here you can see there is a beaver pond here. So there's some sort of dam and then you can see a backup of water. Um, and we want to be able to identify these beaver dams in order to study the impact of beaver dams because beaver are actually very important for um, healthy ecosystems. They keep soil moist to prevent forest fires. They can increase vegetation. They can um, you know, create environments that can support a lot of other biodiversity. And so they have a really beneficial impact also on um, controlling water flow and um, kind of filtering the water with the dams that they produce. And so they have a lot of beneficial impacts. And uh, it's the case though that in many areas, especially in the US, on the East Coast, um, they're kind of butting up against human development and the kind of default policy or, you know, the first go to thing that most humans are going to think to do is to just kind of get rid of them, like maybe, you know, capture and kill them, something like that. And we want to provide um, very targeted evidence that no, these beaver have had a really good impact on the environment in this local area, and therefore they should use non-lethal management techniques and you know relocate the beaver to areas that they will thrive and be able to continue to help the environment. So that's kind of the direct way in which this project is supposed to have impact is by being able to take the satellite imagery, show the impacts of the um, beaver on the surrounding locations. We can talk about where beaver would be most um, beneficial and prove that they were, that they've been beneficial in a local area to kind of inform these kinds of um, practices and policies around beaver. So that's the specific use case that I'm working on now. Um, I'm definitely also exploring other applications um, to, to do with my lab as I kind of build out my lab and get um, students to, to work on these kinds of projects.